On the morning of September 14, 1854, an Anglo-French fleet arrived off the coast of the Crimean Peninsula in the Black Sea. Hundreds of warships, over 400 to be exact, ranging from everything from tiring three-decked warships to sleek frigates and lumbering transports. Thousands of French, English, and Turkish soldiers disembarked at what, the men, what would be later nicknamed Calamity Bay in the Crimean Peninsula. Their objective was the Russian naval base at Sevastopol, 25 miles away. The landing at Calamity Bay would be the first moments of the Crimean War, a war that would come to symbolize Victorian England and would mark the beginning of the end for chivalristic warfare. Both British, French, and Turkish troops landed at the bay. Their commanders, specifically Lord Raglan, was confident that he could crush any Russian force they would come across. But how did this all happen? The true origin of the Crimean War started from Tsar Nicholas I's ambitions to nibble away at the crumbling Ottoman Empire and to establish a Russian presence in the Mediterranean. The French and the English were determined not to let that happen. So they joined the war against them with the Ottomans on moral and Christianity grounds. Europe had not seen a real war since Napoleon, and many young men signed up in droves. Most of them would soon come to regret it. It took five whole days to disembark the entire army at Calamity Bay. The French army was much better prepared than the British, but the Redcoats did not complain. The first evening ashore there was heavy in rain and made the night very miserable. The British had to make do with their sodden greatcoats and a few dripping blankets. The French had tents set up for every soldier, and the Turks also had tents. This was the first in a series of misfortune that would plague the British army throughout the Crimean campaign. The sad truth was that the British army was incredibly unprepared for the ordeal they were to endure. There were no transports or baggage train of any kind for the British army, and foragers were sent into the surrounding countryside to bring in whatever food they could find. An officer of the 42nd Highlanders listed a surprising number of items he carried, including, quote, three days rations of salt pork and biscuit, nine pounds, coca and sugar in his haversack, shirt, hose, boots, brushes, shell jacket and sponges in his knapsack, greatcoat, claymore, sword, dirk and revolver. It was very lucky that the Russians did not oppose the, the landings, just like the Ottomans did at Gallipoli a hundred years later. A solitary Russian officer on horseback watched the landings, took notes, took notes, and galloped off. The ground was treeless and undaunting, perfect for a move of men, horses, wagons, and artillery. The, ally co the Allies covered an area five miles wide and four miles deep. After the rainy, miserable night, spirits soared with the rising sun, and a gentle sea breeze made the air fresh and clean. Long columns of red coats marched as if in review, and regimental bands played stirring airs. The Highland regiments were particularly striking. Large, muscular men with swaying kilts, bobbing feather bonnets, and skirtling bagpipes. Russell of the Times noted, quote, the effect of these grand masses of soldiers descending the ridges of the hills rank after rank with the sun playing over forests of glintering and steel bayonets can never be forgotten." End quote. This romantic version of war was far too fleeting.
Even at this early stage, disease began ramping through the camps. Soon the sea breeze diminished, replaced with sweltering temperatures and flies. As the mercury rose, the sweat-drenched men were tortured by the raging thirst. Exhausted soldiers began to fall out of line, and men began to fall from cholera. The cholera epidemic would soon be rampant, especially among the French. As the columns began the long march to Sevastopol, they left hundreds of dead and half-dead men along the way. It is, said that so, it is said that so many bodies laid sprawled on the ground that it looked as if a major battle had been fought. At last, the Bulganka River was spotted ahead. Discipline momentarily evaporated as men broke ranks and ran to quench their thirst. The kilted warriors of the Highland Brigade did the same, but were quickly checked by their commander, Sir Colin Campbell, and ordered back into formation. Campbell was one of the most respected officers in the British Army and knew what he was doing. The colonel sent forward a detachment that f filled water barrels to the brim, which were then distributed to the thirsty troops. The regiments who had rushed down to the river in a great stampede got the worst of it because thousands of men churned up the sluggish stream and literally muddled, muddied the waters. Thanks to Campbell's foresight, the Highlanders could fill their bottles with clean water. At around this time, a large Russian force showed up near the river, perhaps 6,000 infantry and a brigade of cavalry and some horse-drawn artillery. Brigadier General James Brudel of the 7th Earl of Cardigan was sent out to recounter the Light 13th Light Dragoons and the 11th Hussars with the 2nd and Light Infantry Divisions were called up and placed in readiness. A hot skirmish soon developed, with troopers from both sides firing at each other from horseback. After 20 minutes of blazing away, not one man had been hit, but the artillery was more deadly. Russian cannonballs were bounding like crickets, according to one observer. One Russian shot managed to take the leg off a British soldier. British artillery, six and nine pounders, were brought up and flamed into, into a counter, counter battery. The Russians seemed to tire from the artillery duel. They limbered up and withdrew south. The British had suffered four men wounded, two amputations, and five horses killed. This was just the appetizer of war. The main course was yet to come. Seven miles away lay the river Alma, and beyond the river a series of hills called the Heights of Alma. The Russians were not about to let themselves be bottled up in Sevastopol without a fight. If they were going to make a stand, the heights would be the place to do it. Prince Alexander Menchikov, the Russian commander-in-chief in the Crimea, was sure that the heights of Alma would stop the Allies dead in their tracks. He assured Tsar Nicholas that he could hold the Alma heights for three weeks. Menchikov's overconfidence was founded on a complete misregard for the British soldiers' fighting abilities. The prince considered the British army in the Crimea mere sailors conscripted into military uniform. He was not alone in his contempt for the British, although most Russians admired the French, could fight. The memories of, of the first Napoleon were too fresh to think otherwise. The Alma Heights began to the sea with a bluff called the West Cliff, overlooking the sandy mouth of the Alma as it emptied into the Black Sea. The West Cliff rose precariously about 400 feet. Two miles upriver was Telegraph Hill, so called because of a tower that originally was intended to be a telegraph station. Telegraph Hill and West Hill joined to form a plateau. The main road to Sevastopol ran between Telegraph Hill and another elevation to the east named Corgan Hill, some 450 feet high. Corgan Hill was, in many respects, the key to the heights. The Russians had built a great redoubt on the hill. A breastwork that could help hold 12 guns. 
slightly higher on that hill was the Lesser Redoubt. Those artillery pieces protected the eastern flank. There were also Russian cannons on the approaches to Sevastopol along the road, and guns covering the wooden bridge that spanned the Alma. Most of the 39,000-man Russian army under Menchikov was posted on Telegraph Corgan Hills. Although the British commander, Lord Raglan, had been the protege to the Duke of Wellington, none of Wellington's genius seemed to rub off. For all his fart, with for all his faults, Raglan did occasionally sow some flashes of common sense, if not brilliance. He was not in favor of the Crimean campaign since he left the British army and thought it would woefully unprepared for the campaign. The British government ignored his protests. Nevertheless, Raglan was the soul of tact. When he met with the French commander on the evening of September 19th, he was ill. Feverish, feverish ravages of cholera had made their way through French camps, and the French commander was not the exception. However, the marshal did lay out a battle plan for the Russian position at the Alma for the next day. Raglan politely concurred with little comment. Speaking a mixture of English and French, Saint Arnaud explained that the French would cross the river Alma an attack where the Russians at least expected it. The, the high treacherous western cliff. Warming to the subject, Saint Arnaud said the cliff was lightly defended and since it was at the mouth of the Alma, near the sea, the French would have the additional support of naval covering fire. The British would divert Russian attentions by attacking Telegraph on Corrigan Hill. With any luck, Raglan's army might swing east and roll up the Russian right as the French once they climbed the heights, rolling up the Russian left. Raglan assured saint Anouard of the British support, but little else. The attack began the next afternoon with the French assault. The French Pusukets division led the way, crossing the river mouth by means of a sandbar and climbing up the steep cliffs. Ken Roberts and Prince Napoleon's troops joined the fray, but the attack stalled because of the treacherous tracks up the cliffs. There were too steep for artillery, and the French preferred to attack with artillery support. The British advanced slowly, waiting for the French attack to prosper before going up themselves. The British first line consisted of Evans' second division and the light division. Behind them, the first division. Highland Brigade and the Guards stood in support. All other British troops were held in reserve. The British marching, marched in column, but when they got within range of the Russian guns across the river, they deployed into line. They were told to lie down, which lessened the chance of being hit by a rampaging cannonball. Nevertheless, the artillery fire was so heavy that casualties began to mount. The Redcoats endured a hail of shot and shell for at least 20 minutes, keeping their courage up by giving names to the Russian guns. A French courier galloped up to Raglan, bringing St. Agnon's request for help and added in aiding the typical Gallic overstate. We are being massacred. It was time to advance. Anything was better than a nerve-wracking bombardment. The Light and 2nd Divisions moved out. As they did so, the Russians put Botulek village to the torch. Crackling flames leapt high into the sky, and dense clouds of smoke cast a pall around the immediate area. The acidic smoke and flames threw the second division into a temporary confusion, with one battalion going into the village and the other going to the left. Once the once orderly lines bunched up and the situation was made worse by the light divisions in and Herod call coming in a slight angle so that the elements bumped into their colleagues from the second division. Some grenadiers crossed the river via a small intact wooden bridge, but the river was only about four feet deep on average, and most were able to wade across. The 95th foot and the Royal Welsh Fusiliers became mixed up on the opposite bank 
where the steepness of the slope on Kurigan Hill ironically afforded some protection for the rushing cannonballs. But victory would not be gained by sheltering under the lip of the ground. And before long, the Redcoats set off again through a storm of canister and grape shot. Their advance seemed irresistible. And as soon as they surged up the hill, the Russian gunners on the Great Redoubt ceased fire and began to limber up the guns in a frantic effort to escape the oncoming British force. As the Royal Welsh Fusiliers poured over the lip of the great battery entrenchment, color bearer Lieutenant Harry Anstruther was felled by a Russian bullet. Sergeant Luke O'Connor grabbed the Queen colors on the Lieutenant's dead hands and pledged in the banner in the redoubt, an act for which O'Connor was awarded the Victoria's Cross. The redoubt was now in British hands, and the two Russian guns had been taken in the bargain, but a counterattack was sure to come, and the nearest British help was the Duke of Cambridge's first division, which had not yet crossed the Alma. Cambridge was 35 years old, the only division commander who had not served in the Napoleonic Wars 40 years earlier. In some, if some of the other British generals were too old in some respects, Cambridge was too inexperienced. The Duke was indecisive and uncertain about what to do. He asked a befuddled subordinate, Brigadier General Gentleman George Buller, for advice. Why, your Royal Highness, Buller replied, I am a little confused here. You had better advance, I think, he said. The Vladimir Regiment lurched forward to the redoubt, then halted to wait for the Kazan Regiment to come out in support. While they were waiting, a Russian officer glanced in the direction of Telegraph Hill and saw a small cluster of what he thought was British staff officers. It seemed like a mirage because they were well behind Russian lines. It seemed impossible. Yet the waving plumes and the cocked hats confirmed that they were indeed British. When fighting started, Raglan had decided to go forward and seek a good vantage point from which to watch the action. When he first started out, he was accompanied by a horde of hang-oners, men from the Commissar Medical Corps who wanted to see some of the action as spectators. They grew, they grew to at least 60 riders until they were blocking the view of Raglan and his staff and he let them stay, explaining with a twinkle of his eye, quote, You know, directly we get under fire, those obliged not to remain will depart. You may rely on it, end quote. Surely enough, a Russian round shot fell short and bounced up over the heads of the assembled spectators. True to Raglan's prediction, the hangers scattered like a bunch of scared rabbits. When the Russian artillerymen found they were being bombarded in the flank, they limbered up and withdrew to the, a new position to the rear. Unfortunately for the Russians, the new sites were too far back, neutralizing any advantage they had in firepower. Meanwhile, the guards had waded across the Alma, the Highlanders just behind them, and to their left, the Grenadier Guards were on the right. The Scots Fusilier Guards in the center and the Coldstream Guards on the left. They were the flower of the British Army, the protectors of Queen Victoria herself, formidable in their towering bearskin caps. The Vladimir Regiment poured a heavy fire into the survivors of the 23rd Foot, who were holding a position just below the Great Redoubt, causing them to retreat to down to Corgain Hill. Gaining momentum as they went down the slopes, they crashed into the advancing Scots Fusilier Guards, disordering their lines and sweeping them away. Queen Victoria had a love of Scotland and was partial to the Scots Fusilier Guards. The Coldstream and Grenadier Guards, knowing this, could not resist childing their departing comrades. Shame, shame, what about the Queen's favorites now? Now there was a gap in the Guards' line, and a captain of the Grenadiers orders his company and forward into a right angle. The Guards reformed in a kind of L formation, a gap, ring of fire, that the Russians unwillingly ran into. Volley after disciplined volley cut the Russian ranks with a terrible effect. Once again, British rifle muskets spat many balls with deadly accuracy. The Tsar's troops still carried smooth bore muskets, but not fire back as effectively. Decimated by the hail of British gunfire, the Russians withdrew down the slopes. Some 10,000 unbloodied Russian troops moved forward to try to regain the initiative, but they ran headlong into the Highland Brigade. Celtic warriors were renowned for their famous courage in the battlefield. The men in the 42nd Black Watch, 79th and 93rd Highlanders were led by Campbell himself, an officer of the 42nd. 
Before they crossed the river, the Black Watch passed some vineyards, and as they marched, the sturdy Celts helped themselves to bunches of grapes. The Alma was shallow, about knee high. Although some Highlanders encountered deep pockets where the water rose to chest level. Once across the river, the Highlanders were subjugated to the accurate artillery and rifle fire. The Russian artillery. Shaking off the water from the kilts the best they could, the Highlanders reformed and ascended the hill, firing as they went. This could be done only by the best troops, and the Celts proved their worth. The Highland Brigade advanced in two ranks, literally a thin 200-yard wide line. The Russians were incredulous, scarcely believing their eyes. There were two large columns of Russian infantry in the vicinity. The Sousdale Regiment, wearing spiked helmets, and the Kazan Regiment, in forage caps. The Sousdale Regiment tried to take the 42nd in the flank, but was met by the 93rd and 79th. The steady readiness of the Highlander volleys began to take effect, and the Russian columns wavered, then broke and started to fall back. The guards retook the battered Great Redoubt, while the 93rd Highlanders swept all enemy soldiers away from the rear of the Redoubt, urged on by Sir Colin in his Scottish accent. Will A9 but Highland bonnets here? The Russian withdrawal became a rout. There was nothing to do but seek the safety of Sevastopol. Manjikov seemed in a daze, unable to comprehend the extent of the debacle. He had promised to hold the Alma for three weeks. He had not held it for three hours. As his soldiers streamed into the river, Manjikov called out that it was a disgrace for a Russian soldier to retreat. The prince did not seem to realize he was to blame for the gallant defeat. The Allies have won a decisive victory. And by the time the French Zouaves had planted the tricolors on the top of Telegraph Hill, Saint Anouad was convinced that the French had won the Battle of the Alma, almost unaided. He said as much in his dispatches to Paris, and only his death from cholera a few days later prevented bad feelings from festering between the Allies, who lost 3,342 dead and wounded. The Russians lost more than 6,000 men. The higher casualties stemmed in part from the British tactics and the deadly accuracy of Allied rifled muskets. A great opportunity was lost after the battle. St. Anunod had wanted to push on immediately in the slope in the hopes of taking Sevastopol while the Russians were set off balance and reeling from the defeat. Raglan refused stating that there were 3,000 or so dead, wounded British and Russians to take care of, and that they had three miles of sea and their transport ships. The British commander was also anxious to do a flank march and take Balaclava, the best possible harbor in the area. Hindsight's evidence suggests that saint Renoir was right. Sevastopol bristled with guns, but its defense was still incomplete. There was indeed a chance that the Allies could have taken the naval base but in an all-out attack. On the other hand, Raglan was right in wanting a safe harbor to funnel in men and supplies for the extent of the siege. He could not have known how valuable, how vulnerable Sevastopol was at that time. As it was, the Battle of Alma was only the curtain raiser to a protracted and bloody criminal mismangled campaign. Alma, like the later fight at Inkerman, was a soldier's battle, where the courage and fortitude of the rank and file deemed, at least partially, the blunders and sheer incompetence of their leaders. Alma was only the beginning of the Crimean War.